Welcome, and it's great to have you here. Thank you for, for your time. We've got a guided meditation and a Dharma talk coming up. My name is Jonathan Faust, and I'm really grateful to be able to share these practices with you. Uh, before we begin, some thank yous. First of all, a big thank you to our mindful movement teacher for today. Um, we've got great mindful movement teachers if you ever want to plug into that. And as well, a big thank you to Ray Manioki and Tara Cassidy, who offer mindful dialogue after this session. Uh, if you're looking for the whole Monday night experience, mindful movement, meditation, talk, and then integration in a small group, uh, check out my webpage uh, and also my Facebook page. You'll find more information there as to how you can plug in. Mindful movement starts at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. Um, this meditation is at 7.30. Talk is at 8. And then the mindful dialogue is around um, 8.50, a couple of minutes after this talk ends, assuming I manage to end on time. So also a big thank you to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for producing uh, this event. Deep, deep thanks to you guys. And to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this event, and as well to my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, which has been our, our gracious host for Monday Night Meditation uh, when we're not on quarantine. Do stay tuned. Um, chances are we uh, we won't be really kind of exploring going back live with a live group until after the uh, coast is clear here. So if you'd like to sign up for my mailing list, please feel free. I offer a monthly, um, monthly newsletter with a summary of talks, resources for your practice, as well as my latest photography. And there's also a weekly, if you like, which gives you an update as to what's coming up next. Also, just to say, this is all offered in the spirit of generosity. I love these practices. I love being able to, to offer them. And um, as they're offered freely, if you feel inspired to make a donation to support this, thank you so much. There's, there's actually quite a cost in, in, in putting these out every week. So I appreciate any support you have. And investing in your practice is the greatest gift. So just want to say that. So here we are ready to dive in. Um, our topic coming up is on accessing the flow state. We've been talking about using concentration as a willful way of gathering attention, which is a powerful, powerful practice to do. But there's also um, this, this sense of flow, this sense of being, being awake to what's changing, exploring your relationship to what's changing. So we're going to explore, um, explore that through this meditation, but also um, in the talk. So a lot of what we focus on in the beginning of meditation, as you most probably know, is this sense of willful arriving, the sense of taking this puppy dog of the mind and training it how to sit for longer and longer periods of time. And as you know, puppies respond really, really well to compassion and consistency. And we need to do the same thing for our minds. So if you like, you can close your eyes and you might like to, as you close your eyes, just sense inside what might like to move or shift or change and take some time to let your body adjust. There's so many different aspects to, to, to meditation and to mindfulness and one of them, of course, is this willful gathering. Another is the sense of, of noticing what's changing from this place of non-judging presence. And another quality is this sense of just simply resting in presence without effort at all. So, so you might just take a few moments now to kind of explore that, that, that latter quality as you sense what it's like right now. How much can you feel? How much can you notice? Notice the sounds. And the felt sense of the air touching your skin. And with all that's changing around you, can you sense or just intuit some quality of, of changeless awareness? that which is aware of what's changing.
You might like to now draw your attention inward to your breathing. And you may find it helpful as a willful practice, as a way of arriving to consciously slow down and deepen your breath. It can be helpful to inhale, say, to the count of four or five. And then glide right into the exhalation, again, to the count of four or five. And for these next few minutes, explore what it's like to match the length of the in-breath with the length of the out-breath. Notice the effect on the mind and notice as well that the mind comes in with commentary, but when you're engaging in the concentration practice, you're not really lingering on where the mind goes. Just bring it right back and we'll do two, let's say three more breaths, slow, full, and deep. Give it all of your attention. Now you may elect to stay with this focus and controlled breathing for a while. It can be a very helpful way to begin to calm and arrive and gather. Or you might like to now release control of the breath and shift to observation of the breath. Just noticing as you relax the breath, noticing where you feel the breath the most predominant on the inside right now. A powerful way to to deepen this sense of here and now awareness and here and now experience is to to use the the power of attention to explore what it's like to soften and feel from the inside. Is it possible to relax and soften and feel the scalp, the crown of the head? the forehead and temples, the forehead smooth. The muscles around the eyes softening and feeling. Letting your attention now scan through the muscles of your face. So let the face be smooth and expressionless. In particular, you might relax the inside of the mouth. Softening to the jaw and the lips and the tongue. the back of the head and the base of the skull. The back of the neck and inside the throat.
And you might take some time to sense from the inside the, the volume of your shoulders and shoulder blades. And in particular, to feel the weight of the arms and imagine the, the heaviness and the weight of the arms. Sensing down through the elbows. Down through the wrists. And can you imagine or feel awareness flooding into your palms and fingers and thumbs, the backs of the hands? Relax and soften and feel. And the lungs and the heart. the lower back and the buttocks. And take some time to sense the belly. And again, what could soften? How much could you relax and soften the belly? And how intimately can you feel the movement of the belly as you breathe? the floor, the pelvis, and the hip joints. And sensing down the length of the legs, down through the knees, And down through the ankles. And the tops of the feet and the toes. And sensing from inside again the soles of the feet and the heels. Is there anything right now that could relax or soften inside? And escorting your attention now to an anchor of your choosing, to breath or sound or feeling. And take this next period of time to allow yourself to both relax and soften and let your primary attention be on the feeling of your anchor from the inside, the movement of breath, the vibration of sound, and the aliveness of felt sense, perhaps in the palms, fingers, and thumbs.
you might explore a few possibilities if you notice the mind particularly active and wandering away from the here and now. One option is to count the inhalations from one to five. Another might be to sense and compare if this next inhalation is any different than the inhalation preceding. And a third possibility is to bring your attention more and more intimately to, to where you feel your anchor on the inside. And you may notice that as you willfully bring your attention back again and again, and as you re-relax again and again, you may notice a natural widening of awareness, a heightened perception of the background where everything is shifting and changing. And you might find it helpful or interesting to, to slightly shift your perspective to, to the sense of who you are as the observer and the sense of your capacity to, to witness or watch what's changing. And sense this, this stance or this seat of, of non-judging awareness, of awareness without preference. Just awake to what's changing. And noticing two things. Noticing your relationship to what's changing, the attitude in the mind, any sense of grasping or pushing away, but also noticing if you can allow things to change. If you notice your mind lost in thought, take a few moments to re-relax. Is there anything right now on the inside that could soften or relax or let go? And gently guide your attention back to your anchor, again, sensing from the inside. And as long as it feels right for you, you might willfully allow your awareness to stay present to the anchor. And then again, at some point, you might widen, broaden your awareness, expanding your attention to the sense of flow or to the stream of phenomena passing through. Awake to what's changing, 
awake to the attitude in the mind and exploring what it means to allow things to be. Are you aware of what's happening right now? And can you allow this to be just as it is? In these remaining five minutes or so, you might again refresh your practice, softening on the inside and perhaps the forehead, the inside of the mouth. Softening the palms. softening the belly. Softening the soles of the feet and the heels. You might bring your attention to your anchor and over the next three rounds of breath, explore how intimately you can relax, soften and feel on the inside.
If it feels right for you, you might broaden, widen your awareness. Awake to every, every little thing that is changing. Exploring with both interest and curiosity, and at the same time, a quality of allowing. And in these remaining minutes, you might explore letting go of all technique. Uh, let go of the anchor. Uh, can you even imagine letting go of, of the observer and just simply sense if you can let things be? Is there anything right now that could soften or relax or let go? Is there anything right now that could soften, relax, or let go even more than that? And you might now very gently guide your attention back to your breath and take three slow, deep, and smooth breaths. Again, gathering your attention to the felt sense of the body breathing. You might now begin to let your head drift a little bit to the left and to the right. And as part of your meditation practice, just sense on the inside what would like to move or shift or change right now. And take this time to let your body move, adjust in any way that feels good. <clears throat> you might like to reach your arms up overhead, stretch out. Let out any sounds. Welcome. I've spent an inordinate amount of time driving heavy equipment around in my life. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in southeastern Pennsylvania, and I've worked on a couple of farms in my life. 
when I was in college, I was feeling pretty lost. And I had two fantasies. One was to find a way to refresh my meditation practice. And the other was, how could I possibly live and work on a farm and, and still go to college? And magically, it happened. Um, I met someone by the name of John Peterson, who was a, a recent graduate of the college where I was going. His uh, father had passed away, and he took over the farm. He was also very into meditation, so it was a real sync up. And um, I had many, many happy years of working with John on the farm. And uh, just a quick little, uh, quick little mention, uh, there's a very, very cool film called The Real Dirt on Farmer John, if you Google for it, The Real Dirt on Farmer John, that kind of tells the story of, what, of his life about growing up uh, on a farm in the Midwest um, and then losing the farm in the, uh, the financial crisis. This was after uh, I had left. And then the reinvention of the farm into one of the largest um, biodynamic organic farms in the country. You can also Google for angelic organics. So we were running about a thousand acres when uh, we were working together. And it's now uh, it's much, much smaller, but a really beautiful education center around um, organic biodynamic farming. You know, some people are drawn to farming, uh, I think, for the romance, for the idea of, of growing things. And a lot of people are drawn to the idea of farming for the toys. <laughs> There's so much automation in, in farming right now, and it's, it's really quite stunning how, um, how little manpower it takes having access to these amazing machines that can do so much work. And so, so much of my, my years of living on farms was driving tractors and big trucks and hay cutters and making the big round bales. And one of the most um, intense things um, or exciting things to, to drive is a combine. You've probably seen combines harvesting oats or soybeans or, or corn. Combines are about the size of a small house. And driving one is like sitting sitting in a little in a seat at, at the second second story window. Um, and it's a it's a real rush to to learn how to how to operate one of these. And I wouldn't say I was masterful, but uh, but I, I put in my hours. And we had a combine, and basically you have you have the header, which is this big platform that's in front of you. It's kind of eight rows wide, six rows wide. And it's, it has a, it's hydraulically lifted, so you can lift and lower this whole big head in front of the machine, depending on the conditions, you know, rocks and so forth. And if you're if you're harvesting wheat or oats, there's there's a pickup reel that's turning that, that that pushes the crops down toward the cutter, and then you have a cutter or a sickle bar. It has these teeth, kind of like a big hedge cutter, and Everything kind of falls inward. It's gathered up by, by the pickup reel. And then there, there are augers and screws that, that send it up a conveyor. And then it goes into a threshing drum where it kind of like beats the, the crops to shake the grain free from the stalks. And then the grain falls through these sieves into a collecting tank. And then that gets augered up into a, a collecting tank that's pretty high up on the machine. And then the chaff or the unwanted material, the straw, gets passed along what are called straw walkers. And, and there are fans there that kind of like kind of blow it up in the air as you're kind of still sorting the, um, the grain out. And then the chaff falls out the back of the machine and then you can spread it out evenly or you can put it in a tight row for, for bailing later. An incredibly complex machine just an incredibly complex machine and getting them set up is amazing because you want to, you don't want to set it so much that you have really, really clean grain, but, um, but you're blowing a lot of it out the back, but also you don't want to have too much of the chaff in the grain because then when you take it to the grain elevator where they dry it, they charge you for, you know, they penalize you. So there's so much to figure out, so much detail. And when you're driving it, you're in a little air-conditioned box. It's kind of a windowed box. 
And then you have a steering wheel, which kind of moves back and forth, and you've got the controls here. And then to your right, you've got a panel of lights, because uh, every one of these ball bearings has a sensor to let you know when it overheats. And if any of these sensors go off, there's a red light in front of you to kind of let you know. Why am I telling you this? <clears throat> well, there's something about the attention to detail with so much going on and then sort of this forced shift in consciousness that opens you up into our topic, uh, the flow state, which is this state of being kind of like really aware of all the details and going, going with the flow, if you will. To make it even more complex, there are times when you're harvesting, you're driving along and you have to have everything lined up and make sure that everything's functioning. You've got the, you've got the, the platform just right. You've got everything set. And then a truck will come up next to you. And then you pull a little, a little lever and then you start augering the grain off into the truck. And then you need to slow down and speed up enough so you're filling up the corners of the truck, which is a very complex maneuver. So I, 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 I love the challenge of it and I love learning. And I remember there was one time in particular where I just felt I am the master of the universe. You know, there's everything is working perfectly. I'm monitoring everything. The truck came, I unloaded the truck. And, um, and as I'm moving along, so proud of myself, but at the same time, kind of in this almost mystical sense of, of this, this massive harvesting process. I remember thinking like, how many people with, with um, individual size would it take to harvest what I'm, what I'm harvesting here in five minutes? Uh, I noticed when I took a break that, that one of the sickle teeth had broken. So everywhere I went, there was this one line about three inches wide that it wasn't cut. And of course I, got yelled at later, which was, which was deserved, deservedly so. So I thought it was in flow, but it was actually missing a really important, really important thing. Accessing the flow state is a fascinating, really fascinating thing because when you're in the flow state, it's very tied into what we've been exploring recently and in meditation about how it's related to concentration and how concentration in your meditation practice can, can sort of set you up to sort of widen your attention and access the sense of flow. So much of meditation is about the willful gathering of attention where you're arriving again and again and again. And in that sense of arriving, you can sometimes kind of really magically open up into the present moment. We talked before about access concentration how you can move deeper and deeper into these amazing states of, of absorption. This kind of upwelling of, of intense pleasure that comes out of, out of the moment itself and then deeper levels of access. What I'd like to talk about here is what some people think of as a progression in meditation, where you move from tight and focused concentration and you become more aware of the background you become more aware of change and you become more aware of what, what some call flow. So in four parts, I'd like to talk about first the magic of being in the flow state. And I'd like to explore a little bit is, is the flow state mindfulness. And there's some really cool distinctions there. I'd also like to talk a little bit in the third part about how, how to, how to like sabotage the flow state and also how to access and how to reinforce the flow state. I remember way back when I had never played ping pong before in my life, but someone challenged me to a game and I said, sure, I'll play. And we were sort of mildly bopping the, the ping pong ball back and forth. And, and for some reason I, I kept hitting it back. And the person I was playing with got a little more intense and I just kept hitting it back. And, some of our um, some of our rounds went like like fifteen or twenty rounds back and forth, and 
it was everything kind of slowed down and I could I could begin to anticipate where the ball was going to go next. And it was an amazing experience. The first time in my life I'd ever picked up uh, a, a ping pong racket or whatever you call it. And then in the midst of this amazing back and forth, and I could see he was getting more and more frustrated and hitting it back harder. And I just sensed where it was going to go and managed to bop it back to him. And I had this thought and said, I am crushing this. I'm, I'm amazing at this. I immediately missed the next ball. And I never got that feeling back playing table tennis. I never back to that extent. I think part of that was, was beginner's mind. I had no idea what to expect. But part of it was about getting into that flow state. And, and you may be aware of that flow state in your life. Um, probably one of the most um, authoritative people on the flow state is uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, Sh- <laughs> it's a very complicated name. <laughs> Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. He wrote about the flow state, uh, accessing kind of optimal, optimal states of happiness. And he said that flow is a state of mind in which a person becomes fully immersed in an activity, completely involved and focused in what they're doing. Now, the flow state is usually most easily accessed in something that's active. It might be being in nature, playing sports, dancing, playing music, listening to music, playing chess rock climbing, working on a project. It might be, might be a conversation. Um, you can experience flow in, in, in groups as well. There's been a huge amount of attention paid to the flow state. Uh, I'll share some resources at the end. And uh, it's, it's fascinating reading about this because it can dramatically shift not only your meditation practice, but, but your creativity and your expression. You can access the flow internally as an individual by some some key practices that kind of call on a number of factors to support you in getting more immersed and more absorbed into your experience. But we also experience flow as a group. When you're experiencing something together, um, when you're playing sports with, with others or even observing sports, the you know, the sense of the crowd, you know, kind of ebbing and flowing with the game. Uh, listening to music as a group, when you're collaborating with someone. <clears throat> Improv is just a great example of being completely absorbed in kind of this arising moment. And, and flow is really, it's sort of a spectrum. Think of it as a spectrum. It's kind of like anger. You can be mildly peeved all the way to murderer's rage. <laughs> so you can experience sort of like light flow kind of like like little micro flows all the way to very very deep mystical qualities of experience but i think it's to say that i think it's safe to say that that flow is a wholesome state and then the question is how does it relate to mindfulness and how does it relate to meditation we tend to think of of meditation as subject object. So let's say you're focusing on your breath. And the practice is about keeping your attention on the object of the breath. Mind wanders, you bring it back. But sometimes there can be there can be a shift where subject and object drop away. Maybe it's most beautifully expressed by by the poet Li Po in this very short little poem. He said, we sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. So that sense of, of I and my, I and mine kind of drops away. Of course, we can't make, we can't make those moments happen but we can cultivate the background. So for the past many weeks, I have the incredible blessing of living by the water on Cape Cod. And um, I'm really big into long distance swimming, you know, as is Tara. That's one of the things we love. 
So we're swimming in the bay, uh, no longer swimming in the ocean because uh, um, swimming as shark bait is no longer very attractive, but swimming in the bay and it's open water. There, there's strong currents. There's, there could be very, very big waves. There's wind, it can be cold. It's, it's challenging, uh, but it's stimulating. It's skill building. And um, recently I've been swimming about a, a mile a day in open water. And, and I, I take swimming as a mindfulness practice. <clears throat> and what's fascinating about it is sometimes I can, I can kind of get a sense of that flow state. Usually when I start off, I'm kind of focused on, on the sensations. I'm kind of being aware of form. Uh, I can be kind of aware of my, my, my thoughts, you know, is it, which way is the current going and am I close enough to shore? So I'm, I'm beginning to sort of be aware more and more of my form, of my breathing. One of the things that I have to do is keep gauging where I am in relationship to the shore. I don't want to go too shallow, um, but I don't want to go too deep because there, there, are, there are sharks on the bay side as well. So there are times when I'm, when I'm swimming and everything is so smooth. You know, I start to relax. I, I start to, I start to focus. And it feels sometimes like my body is doing it all by itself. It's all kind of like programmed and I can feel that I can feel that flow state. And then, then something occurs where I'll become aware that my form is a little bit off or I'll realize that my, my right arm isn't extending quite as far as the left arm. And then I'll do a course correction. And I kind of concentrate on the form and then I'll sort of open again back to the flow state where I sort of relax and I kind of feel my body moving by itself. I think that's kind of how, how mindfulness works. You're, you're aware of, of what's happening. And what also happens in what I'm swimming and in meditation is it kind of sets you up for insight. You realize like, oh, my, my feet are dropping a little bit. Let, let me bring them up a little bit. Oh, I'm really aware that I'm, I'm getting competitive. Let me just notice that. And then, of course, there are times where, where I'm just swimming. And those are kind of those ecstatic moments where I'm not trying to make anything happen. I kind of drop into this, this incredible sense of no I, no mine. I'm just swimming. So in many ways, this is what we do in, in our meditation practice. So you might, as a little experiment, if you like, you can close your eyes and, and if you would, just move your attention to your breath and, and, and feel your breath. And you might slow down your breath. Notice where you feel it on the inside. And now, can you sense the observer? What is it that is aware of your breathing right now? And, and take a few moments, if you will, to kind of sense if you can firmly establish yourself in what, what some call the seat of the witness. Objective, non-preferential awareness. And then just allow yourself to explore the next two questions. What would happen if the witness was to simply fall away? Can you sense of just for a moment the, the light behind the witness? If you like, you can deepen your breath and feel free to remain with your eyes closed. Or if you like, you can open your eyes. So is, is mindfulness the same as the flow state? They're certainly intermingled, but some would say that they're not. Here's an interesting definition of mindfulness. 
non-elaborative, non-judgmental, present-centered awareness in which each thought, feeling, or sensation that arises in the attentional field is acknowledged and accepted as is. Let me read that again. Here are the qualities. It's non-elaborative. So you're not adding a story to it. It's non-judgmental. No good, no bad. It's present-centered. And every thought, feeling, or sensation that arises in the intentional field is acknowledged and accepted. So this, this state, so it's a mental state, it requires some self-discipline because you have to be aware of what's happening in order to accept it and acknowledge it. You have to learn how to maintain awareness of each passing moment. And you have to cultivate this attitude of, of allowing and acceptance. Flow involves intense task concentration. But here's the difference. A loss of self-awareness, an altered sense of time, and merging of activity and awareness. So here's, this is maybe the best way to sum it up. Mindfulness is like you're standing on the bank of a river watching the stream. So you're the observer on the bank of the river watching the stream. Flow is where you lose the observer into an altered state. So you're, you're in the stream. So the similarities are the, the two states are they're rewarding. They're all about the present moment. They're all about optional functioning, and they're all about kind of like optimal mental health. But it's the difference between being the observer and a kind of losing the observer as you get absorbed into the experience. So it, it's variable, and, and we can't make it happen. I had a, a brief conversation with my Dharma brother, David Cabrera, who's an incredible musician and songwriter, and he was saying that that in songwriting, you have to be aware of the emptiness and this quality of listening. He said, sometimes the, the flow state, it's like it comes to me. You have to wait and let it come to you. But he added this, which I think is a really important point. He said, the truth is it's always there. Like the, the, the flow state, that sense of absorption, of change, it's always there. And it's delicate, you, you, you know, as the saying goes, you, you can't make this happen. All we can do is cultivate the, the optimal state for it to happen. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what is it that sabotages the flow state? Uh, Lamar Odom who was a teammate of Kobe Bryant, the, the late Kobe Bryant, noticed in one particular game that Kobe got really quiet, which is kind of unusual. And he realized that something special was going to happen. And what was going to happen was the second highest single game scoring level in the NBA, where Kobe got into a flow state. And later, after the game, he was asked about what, what did he do that allowed him to score so many points? And he said, that was just something that happened. It's tough to explain. He said, it just turned into something special. And to sit here and say, I grasp what happened, that would be lying. I love that description. It's, it just turned into something special. And to say that I grasp what happened would be lying. It is this mystical experience. I ran across this other description, which I found very, very helpful. Where someone wrote, <clears throat> this is someone who's very into jujitsu and competition. He said, competitions can be really nerve wracking. Let alone in jujitsu, people are trying to break your limbs or choke you unconscious unless you tap out. Everyone is out there to win, and nobody wants to disappoint their team or their family or their friends. 
There are lots of spectators. It's easy to get caught up in all that. I felt it in previous competitions, and I still feel it sometimes if I'm not being aware and conscious. That's why I worked on activating my flow state on command. Being in the flow is powerful. This is because you are one with existence, in tune with the moment. During the tournament, I took the approach of emptying my mind, thinking of waves and being hollow on the inside moving the subtle energies throughout my body, being formless and shapeless like Bruce Lee once said. I had no desire to win or lose, no thoughts, just watching and observing. Once they called me up to my matches, I, I let go and my body moved for me. When the matches started, it was almost like an out-of-body experience in the sense that, that I wasn't there. I could hear my opponents breathing hard, while my breath was calm, like I was just taking a walk. I ended up going undefeated. After going undefeated the whole day, taking gold in my division, winning my first match in the next division and calling for the finals, I had one match left. It was against a guy who had been dominating the local competition scene. He was short, but built like a tank. He specialized in my technique. Then desire kicked in. I wanted to beat him. My mindset changed. I started thinking about how I could win this match and get two gold medals in one day. I started wanting and needing it. And this is when the flow state was disrupted. I felt it. I was no longer in alignment. My ego came back and I ended up losing the match. And this is when I had the epiphany that the more you desire something, the more work it'll take to get it. This is forcing. You have to work a lot harder to get what you want this way. But when you no longer desire something and just choose to be present and let go, it'll come to you a lot easier. I went undefeated when I was desireless. My only loss came from my need to win. This is because when you're needing something to happen, it means you're lacking it. When you no longer need it, you're coming from a place of already having it. So we all know this place <laughs> of having no access to flow. Everyone, everyone hits a slump. Slump is a really interesting word. I, I looked it up. It means to fall or sink into a muddy place. And all athletes go into a slump and all creative people go into a slump. Writer's block is kind of a classic example of, of slumping. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he, his best work was in his 20s and he basically spent the rest of his life bemoaning the loss of his gift. Truman Capote, I found out with a little research, spent the last 10 years of his life pretending to write a novel that was never there. Can you imagine? The flow state he got into to, to produce the pieces that he did that had so much impact and spending 10 years pretending to write a novel that was never there. Oh, suffering. And Stephen King, who... You don't think of him as having writer's block the way this guy cranks out words. But he, he wrote this in his book on writing. He said, there may be a stretch of weeks or months when it doesn't come at all. This is called writer's block. Some writers in the throes of writer's block think their muses have died, but I don't think that happens often. I think what happens is that the writers themselves sow the edges of their clearing with poison bait to keep their muses away often without knowing they are doing it. That implies that there's some kind of self-sabotage that keeps us from, from accessing that flow state. I'm sure you know that feeling. <laughs> when you can't get any creativity flowing, you, you've got ideas, but you can't execute, you're feeling utterly utterly cut off from, from any sense of spontaneity. And how much of that 
is a sense of self-sabotage. Because while the flow state is exquisite, there's we can only access the flow state when we when we set I and mine aside. There are these magical, mystical moments when there's no I or mine present. That's both exhilarating and it can also feel a little bit disorienting. It can also feel a little scary. So if you think of the flow flow state as this intrinsic state, where the mind is not disturbed, there's no sense of I and mine, it becomes very, very clear that you can't manufacture it. You can't make it happen. All you can do is cultivate the most optimal environment possible. And this is where mindfulness comes in. This is where we come back to the I won't say the basics, but there's something elemental in mindfulness. Moment to moment attention on purpose, concentration, arriving again and again and again. Because what happens is, if you, as I like to say, if you want to get concentrated and you engage in the concentration practice, you become more and more intimately aware of how you're not concentrated. You can begin to identify the patterns of resistance. You can begin to see the different ways that you get distracted. You can, you can begin to see into the nature of the scattered mind. And you get more information. You become wiser in your capacity to cultivate concentration. If you decide you want to cultivate a, a greater sense of, of compassion and kindness and joy, and you bring your attention to the heart practices, inevitably, what you're going to begin to notice is how your heart is closed. All the wounding around your heart that has you, has you shut down. All the ways that you judge, all the ways that you hold life at bay, all the ways you close down. That's part of the fruit, if you will, of your practice. And as a result is you get more familiar with the mechanism of a closed heart. And you might get some insights and see some possibilities as to how you can open your heart again to life. In that same way, when you bring your attention to, to what it means to be in the flow state, what it means to be in that sense of no I, no mind, the unfolding moment happening all by itself, what you'll begin to notice is everything that's between you and feeling ease. Everything between you and, and feeling trust. Everything between you and a quality of allowing and letting be. And so we come back to practice. Again and again and again, we come back to the here and now, which is the beauty of this, this practice of mindfulness. You relax, you soften. You can relax and soften through willful attention. You bring your attention to to, the, to an object that's in the present moment, again and again, you bring your attention back. You re-arrive. You can widen your attention. Notice what's changing. Notice the flow. And of course, what you notice is you notice what's happening, but then you, if you pay attention, you notice your relationship to what's happening. And you'll notice preferential awareness. You'll notice the stuff you like, the stuff you don't like, the stuff you're grasping for, the stuff you try and shut down. All of that is part of the fruit of the practice, is seeing what's between you and that flow state. It's challenging. It's hard, but there's incredible fruit in this practice. And just as my friend David was saying of how the flow state is always there, it's like, like you're, if you've ever taken a plane and it's raining and intense storms and clouds and you take off and you get right above the clouds, sunshine. So noticing what's between you and that flow state becomes super helpful. And here we have the classic teachings of recognizing the five, the five mind states that make it impossible to access the present moment, that make it impossible to access the flow state. 
Anywhere there is anger, judgment, ill will, comparing mind, hatred. Anywhere there's wanting, desire, fantasy, planning. Anywhere there's worry, anxiety, restlessness. Anywhere there's density, anywhere there's sleepiness, fogginess, depression. Anywhere where there is a sense of doubt or getting getting hamstrung or paralyzed by the, by the ruthless critic. The more you engage into an honest, authentic exploration of your relationship to presence, your relationship to the flow state, the more all of this gets amplified. It's like the neon, neon lights occur. Whenever there's a self that's doing something, Whenever there's a sense of I and mine trying to make it happen, it's no go on flow. It's the bad news and the good news. You know, the bad news, there are all these impediments to accessing presence. The good news is when you recognize them, they lose their power. And you can begin to open doorways that are going to take you into these incredible states of possibility. Noticing what's between you and flow can really help you to address this. And the beautiful thing is, just as, just as in meditation practice, there are, there are guidelines, there are techniques, there are best practices that can, can help you to arrive and cultivate presence there are these same observations that you can apply in accessing more flow in your life. And I hate to tell you this, but we're not going to have enough time in this talk to talk about all the nuances of accessing the flow state. So we're going to pick this up down the road. But one way to think of it is that any time you allow yourself to get concentrated in the present moment, and any time you can begin to allow yourself to relax and be aware of what's changing and how you're relating to it, these are some of the elemental aspects of tapping into the flow state. Just a few things before we, before we close. What's so interesting is, is how when you are, when you're in a flow state, <clears throat> you know, when there's no sense of I or mine, when there's this sense of like getting deeply, deeply immersed into what's happening, all kinds of stuff is happening in your brain. Uh, the uh, journalist, uh, Stephen Kotler, talks about what he calls the fantastic five. He says that neuroepinephrine and dopamine tighten focus. They help you shut off the persistent distractions of, of a multitasked life. Endorphins block pain and let you burn the candle at both ends without burning out altogether. And then anandamine, anandamide, prompts lateral connections and generates gestalt insights far more than most brainstorming sessions. And serotonin, the feel-good chemical at the heart of Prozac revolution, bonds teams together more powerfully than the best intentioned offsite. So let's close with a, with a meditation here. If you like, you can close your eyes. And take a moment just to allow yourself to kind of sense this sort of inherent background of spaciousness and allowing. Can you sense the, the flow or the stream that's happening right now? There's a, there's a, there's a flow of, of sensations, uh, sounds, feeling tone. There's a flow of thoughts. There's a flow of emotions, a flow of states. 
Can you imagine all happening by itself? And take a few moments now to begin to sense what could soften or relax. You, you may have some particular areas that sort of like kick off the relaxation response. For me, you know, it's the forehead smooth, letting your tongue relax and fill your lower jaw, softening palms, soles of the feet. relaxed and alert. You might bring your attention now to a focal point and take a few moments to dial in your concentration. If it's breath, how intimately can you feel the breath on the inside? And can you blend deep relaxation with concentration and just feel the effect if just for a few moments? Sense this observer and sense of you can now widen your awareness, aware of everything that's changing. And just over these next few minutes, you might explore the following. Can you drop all technique now? Let the anchor fall away. And can you imagine no I, no mine? Awake to what's changing. and allowing everything to be exactly as it is. Can you imagine both this sense of a high level of concentration, you're aware of what's here, but also a quality of effortlessness. You might deepen your breath. If you like, you can let your body move and shift. If you like, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I, I, I get excited about these practices for what they can do for all of us to cultivate a greater sense of here and now, to create a greater sense of, of not just flow, to be aware of what's changing, but the, the pointers toward this possibility of, of what happens when I and mind falls away what it's like to be present in your life without worry, without anxiety. Those states are so interesting. <laughs> They're so enjoyable and so wholesome. So you might explore from time to time, whatever you're immersed in, whether it's preparing a meal or putting dishes away or just out for a walk, how intimately can you be awake to exactly what's happening at the same time, the same time as it's happening? to usher in a sense of effortless awareness and to allow yourself perhaps just glimpses of what it's like to simply allow things to be, allow things to flow. Next time we'll talk more about, about some of the, the characteristics of the flow state and some of the ways that you can more and more readily create the conditions that can help you 
access this, uh, this amazing state of presence. Thank you so much. Many, many blessings in your practice.